time we have. So with that, I'm going to just say a word of prayer for us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful for being able to be here today and, and worship and, and gather and uh, reason concerning your word this morning, Father. I pray that this lesson study that we study today, Lord, that your Holy Spirit's presence will be amongst each and every one of us and that uh, our hearts and minds will be open to be able to accept the seeds that are planted today and that, uh, that they would grow, Father. And I pray that uh, we will have wisdom and understanding through your Spirit today, Father, and that above all that Jesus Christ would be lifted up in this lesson today, Father. Speak through me that your words be spoken today and not mine, Father, I pray. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so today we're looking at Abraham's seed. Uh, is the heading. I'm going to start out with reading the memory text as usual. And uh, the memory text is found in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. And it reads, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye sh should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Okay. Um, so briefly, I'm just going to read through Sabbath afternoon. Uh, so there, it's talking about in a small town a, there's a window that has a in a jeweler's uh, shop it has a window um, and one day it stopped at a quarter to nine many of the citizens it says had been depending on this clock to know the time on this particular morning businessmen and women glanced in the window and noticed it was only 15 minutes to nine children on their way to school were surprised to find they still had plenty of time to loiter Many persons were late that morning because one small clock in the jeweler's window had stopped. So they were depending on this clock always, and then they realized that, not realizing that the clock had stopped, they thought they had plenty of time still, but they didn't. Um, so it's showing us an example. It says, how accurate a representation of ancient Israel's failure, the Lord placed Israel in the midst of the nations, in the strategic bridge land between three continents. You know, uh, it doesn't, the lesson study doesn't say that, but I believe part of the reason, because uh, Sunday's lesson is, is uh, why did God choose Israel? One of the reasons is what it says right here. Uh, it says that uh, the Lord placed Israel in the midst of nations uh, between three continents. So in other words, we have a place where all these surrounding nations were able to, to, they were in the midst of it, so they were able to go out to these nations and preach the gospel to them, or witness to them, ancient Israel. Um, but it's, it goes on to say, um, it says, they were to be the spiritual clock of the world. Israel, however, stopped in a sense like the clock in the jeweler's, in the jeweler's window, yet it was not a total failure. For then as today, God has his faithful remnant. Our study this week focuses on the identity and role of God's true Israel in every age, including our own. Uh, the focus today really is God's true Israel. So keep that in mind as we go into this lesson a little bit further here. So, yes, sir, go ahead. Good to meet you, Alex. Alicia. Alicia, I'm Tim. Nice to meet you. And uh, we are from, uh, we're members of San Francisco. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Interesting. So, I'm from the Bay Area myself. You're from the Bay Area? Yeah, I'm from San Jose originally. San Jose. Yeah. We don't say we're from San Leandro. Okay. The, the name is unknown. Right. Yes, yes, that's true. <laughs> but we are members of the Central Church, San Francisco Central Church. All right. I see. Yeah, okay. So, something's going on there. Pretty good, but we're not there. I see. First day. I see. Uh, <coughs> let me see here. And also, my personal opinion on all this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, COVID. Uh huh. Uh, we're vaccinated. I now. see. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good. Mm -hmm. Why he chose Israel. Yes. So, of all people that in there in Egypt, is 
is basically when they were coming out of Egypt mm -hmm. in Exodus. Mm -hmm. And then, while, uh, uh, and then unbeknown to the people, that uh, Yahweh God chose this, uh, <coughs> this small uh, group of people, this Israelite. Mm -hmm. So I looked into the why, and then I, there is really no uh, uh, the right answer of why. I think in all the reading that I, I did, it only says it is choice. Yes. Uh, you know, there's, there's no if and what, but God just said, I will take you. Uh, in Exodus, he said, <coughs> I took you out of Egypt in eagle's wing. Yes. Eagle's wing in those days is means power. Yes. So they probably are in, in the best car. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So I, th I think I, I think that uh, really it's very important uh, to know that <clears throat> he took this group of people and then for his own. We we see the uh, we, we see the conversation time and time and again in the Bible that his people as his own. Mm -hmm. So men, people, and they say, this is mine. It's like a child. Yes. They a car. Uh-huh. This is my car. Sure. You know. So it, it, it's very interesting. Well, let's see if we can get a little bit more information and insight, because I have some things to share okay. that might give us a better understanding as to why he chose Israel. Okay. Because as you mentioned, the scriptures just say, well, we'll look at him in just a moment, but I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Um, so let's take a look at Sunday's lesson for starters. In Sunday's lesson, the, the heading is Above All People. Um, and you know, when you think about that, you think above all people. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't God want us to be humble and humility? And so why are we talking above? And what is he talking about when he says above all people? Let's see if we can find the answers to that question here. So, uh, the scripture in Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Okay, so, uh, and the lesson tells us, no question about it, he had specifically chosen the Hebrews people to be his representatives, right? Um, the crucial point to remember, too, is that the choice was totally the act of God, an expression of his grace, uh, there, was, there was nothing found in the people themselves that made them deserve this grace. There couldn't be grace because grace is something that comes undeserved, right? It says this grace, there couldn't be because grace is something that it comes as, uh, as undeserved. Okay, uh, so let's just take a look, see what Ezekiel 16 verse 8 says. And if anybody wants to read that for me, Feel free, and if not, I can read it. So, Ezekiel 16, verse 8. 16, verse 8. I'm going to go ahead and read it for the sake of time. So, it says, When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you... Uh, I have a word here that for some reason didn't come out right in this. Uh, but he says, uh, that your mind says the Lord. Um, I don't think I have the whole, the right, 16.8. Is, is that what you guys have the same what I just read? Anybody have that scripture, Ezekiel 16.8? Uh, what, which uh, version are you reading from? Do you know which? ESV? 
Oh, the clear word. Okay. Well, it's kind of interesting. I like that the, the word that was used, used there was covenant. Covenant. Mine basically says, um, I swore an oath to you and entered it. Well, no, you said a marriage, right? Yes. So, you know, mine says an oath and entered into a covenant with you, but yours says entered into a marriage with you, which I, I, is totally correct, but I just wanted to bring that up. Um, so, what's that? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so, Israel was a small group of people without great culture or prestige, right? Uh, they had no special qualities. It says, the election was the act of God alone. The ultimate cause for the choice lay in the mystery of divine love. Yet the fact is that God did love Israel and did choose her, thereby honoring his promise to the fathers. Um, so I, I was, it's interesting because I was looking Okay, um, at the scripture I had here, and uh, for some reason, uh, give me just a minute here, because uh, I'm trying to, 16 verse 8, um, it's not the scripture that, that gives me the, what I'm looking for, uh, but the scripture that I was looking for, the reason that he says is because he tells them that because he loved them and swore an oath to their fathers. And we'll come by that scripture if I can pull it up here in just a second. Um, I'm not finding it, but it's going to come back up. Um, but part of the reason also is you have to think about Abraham. Abraham was chosen by God. Why? Because he was faithful, right? Right? So if he's going to make a people out of Abraham, which he told him he was, then part of the reason was because of Abraham's faith. Let me just read from my notes here for a minute. Um, he was confident that Abraham, being a faithful person, would instruct his children, right? Because his children were going to be the heirs to the promise, right? They were going to be a nation of people, right? So if they came from Abraham then God knew that he would probably, most likely, instruct his children in the way of the Lord, right? So that's one of the reasons also why he chose, other than the fact that he says he, he swore an oath to the fathers, and so he's keeping his covenant promise. That's another reason. Um, go ahead, brother. What did you have to say? Yes. Will do his purpose. Yes. So, uh, uh, do his bidding. So, he, he has chosen people that are not perfect. If you look at them, they're not perfect. Uh, uh, like, uh, like Noah, they're not perfect. Like, uh, uh, who is this guy that uh, sent to, uh, to, uh, to go to uh, Nineveh? Uh, Jonah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, and also, let me, let me continue reading. Also, he needed a, a people for the Messiah to come through. So he had to choose a people. Um, so remember at the, at the foot of Mount Sinai, if we, looked at, if we took a look at Deuteronomy 7, okay, it's important. Deuteronomy 7, verses 7, 8, and then 9, possibly. But just go there with me, if you would, and I'm just going to read something just briefly. Um, so at the foot of Mount Sinai, God told Israel he had selected them not because of power or of numbers. You know, they've always been a, a fraction of the human population. They're a small nation, right? So it's not because they were a great nation uh, or, or many or powerful, God says. Okay? Um, so he didn't pick them for that reason, right? 
Um, but because he loves them and sees unique potential in them to become a treasure people, because that's what the, the Bible says, a treasure people. If you look in, in Ezekiel 19, um, starting at 5 through 8, um, and, and a kingdom of priests, right? And a holy nation. So he's choosing these people for that purpose. And so, so Jesus is the ultimate reason, as I mentioned, because uh, God needed a nation for the Messiah to come through. But not for this purpose only, but that they would go and teach others, as you mentioned, spreading the gospel. Okay. Um, however, though, we know that Israel failed, right? Israel failed in their, in their mission. Um, not totally, because it, it wasn't the whole nation. It, because remember, God always has a remnant. So even though the Jews had failed as a nation, they didn't, we don't get saved a, a, as, as groups anyway. We get saved individually, right? So um, I, wanna, I just want to throw this out there real quick because I have it in my notes. It'll come up later, though. Uh, because the, the question would be, that, though, really today what we're looking at is who is Israel? Who is Israel? Okay, we know that they were a chosen people by God. Uh, so, so let's start with that. Um, where did the name Israel come from? We all know, or most of us know. Where did the name come from, Israel? <laughs> Remember when Jacob wrestled with the angel or excuse me uh, yeah Jacob wrestled with the angel remember that story okay and then his name was changed from Jacob which means deceiver right to Israel remember God changed his name to Israel that's why the people are called Israelites because they're descendants of Jacob which Abraham Isaac and Jacob right so the name comes from there but Israel what does Israel mean uh, it has n n num numerous meanings, but in this case, I want to say that it's, it means overcomer or victorious, okay? Because remember, the angel wrestled with him, and he was victorious, right? He overcame, right? So keep that in mind, because you'll see, hopefully, if we have enough time, and I'm going to make sure I do that. There's something really, really interesting and important here that we can learn today in this lesson study. So, Israel. Who is Israel? Um, so I'm also going to add that, however, uh, the death of Jesus led to the spreading of the new covenant, both to Jews and Gentiles, right? So now we just claim our faith by G in Jesus Christ and the covenant promises through Jesus Christ. Okay, see, because before they had to claim those literal covenantal promises, they had to do all those... Which, by the way, I just want to say, for the sake of time, I'm just throwing things out there because I want to try to get this to come together. So, keep in mind that everything in the Old Testament was pretty much in a literal sense. For example, if you were going to confess your sins and, and, and be forgiven for your sins, you had to literally provide blood of an animal. Do we do that today? Do we have to pro provide blood for forgiveness of our sins? No. There was all the things in the sacrificial system that we know are, are, are already fulfilled in Christ, so we no longer do those things. So the point I'm making is that you always have to keep in mind, and, and, and believe it or not, there's a, a lot of religions that don't believe this or understand it, okay? And what I mean by that is that everything in the Old Testament was literal, but when Christ came and fulfilled everything, everything became spiritual. So think of the temple, the building. There's no need for the building anymore. I mean, we have a sanctuary now. We call it a sanctuary. But really, the sanctuary is Jesus, and it's in heaven. It's a spiritual thing. So everything before was on the outward. And the Bible always talks about the flesh being the outward, and the inward is what God focuses on the spiritual part okay so when you think of Israel there was a literal Israel before okay so who is Israel who is Israel you know you might say well it's the people 
No, it, technically it's not the people. It's not the Jews, the Israelites. So what is Israel then if it's not that? Let's see if we can find out. Let's dig a little deeper. Okay, so. Um, so the reason he chose him, what the lesson tells us and what the scripture tells us, and I didn't see the scripture, but we'll, like I said, we'll come up to it. It's, it's because he loved them and he swore an oath to the fathers and the other reasons that we mentioned. But that's what the scripture tells us. Um, let me read a little bit from, from Sunday's lesson. We're going to move on to Monday's quick here. Um, she had been chosen in virtue of Yahweh's love for her. She had been liberated from slavery in Egypt by a display of Yahweh's power. Let her once grasp these great facts, and she would realize that she was indeed a holy and a specially treasured people. Um, I'm going to read the bottom here, what I have highlighted. Well, I'm going to read the whole bottom because it's important. That, that we hear these words. According to the divine plan, the Israelites were to be a royal, they were to be both a royal and priestly race. In an evil world, they were to be kings and moral and spiritual, in that they were to prevail over the realm of sin. As priests, they were to draw near to the Lord in prayer, in praise, and in sacrifice. As intermediator, uh, intermediate, intermediaries between God and the heathen, they were to serve as instructors, preachers, and prophets, and were to be examples of holy living, heaven's exponents of true religion. So these were the things that God had called this people out to be, right? They were to be all these things. They were basically, as we mentioned earlier, were supposed to be the people that were supposed to represent the oracles of God, in other words, the word of God, and the understanding of God uh, and the character of God to the nations around them. Okay? That was their mission. That's who Israel was supposed to be. But we're going to see who Israel is, who Israel truly is. Yes? Yes? Yes. Yes. So it's a temporary thing. Yes. If you do this, you have uh, the, uh, the Ten Commandments. If you don't do it, you will die. But if you do it, uh, it will be a uh, happy life forever. Yeah, we're going to take a look at a couple of the scriptures here right now on this uh, Monday's lesson. It's a, it's a, or it, it's Tuesday's lesson. Um, so Monday's lesson is the land deal. Um, was there a covenant that God made with Abraham concerning a land deal? Yeah? yeah? He doesn't know what. What's that? He doesn't know what. He doesn't know where the land is. Doesn't know where the land is. Yes, Abraham doesn't know exactly where at this point because it's not going to happen until his descendants years later in the time of the Exodus, right? So, uh, if we looked at uh, 3512 in... Uh, Genesis 35, 12, uh, it says, The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you and to your descendants after you, I give this land. So this is the land deal that God had promised him. He promised him that he was going to give him this land, which interestingly enough, this land was the promised land, right? Mm -hmm. That they were to enter into, right? Um, and then we're going to be looking at, uh, we're going to be looking at this spiritual promised land and how it relates to God is showing them examples of a kingdom that he wants them to enter into and that he wants us to enter into, right? Um, let's just go back to the lesson here for a minute. It says, the promise that land would be given to God's people, Israel, was first given to Abraham and then repeated to Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, or Isaac and Jacob. Joseph's deathbed words repeated this promise informed Abraham that 400 years would pass before the seed of Abraham would take possession of the land. So the promise that God gave Abraham, yeah, it wasn't fulfilled in Abraham's time, was it? This land deal, right? It says in Genesis 15, 13, and 16 that 400 years would pass before they would be able to inherit this land, right? And we know that the Exodus, they were taken into the land of Canaan, right? The promised land. Um, 
Let's take a look at Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 15. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to read through because we're so limited on time right now. So let me just ask this question because this is what the lesson is focused on. I'm just trying to jump ahead. Was there conditions to, to these covenants? And was there a condition to this land covenant? Or did God just say, no, here's a land for you. Just take it and do whatever you want. No, there was conditions. There definitely was conditions. So let's take a look at 28, um, verses 1. It says, Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments in which I command you today, that the Lord God will set you high above all nations of the earth. So we saw that the study before was above all people, right? So here he's saying, I'm going to set you high. And what is he saying? I'm going to set you high above all nations of the earth. How is he planning to do that? And what is he talking about? Feel free to comment if you have a, a comment. Okay, so it was on condition, as I mentioned. 28.15 says, but it shall come to pass. And by the way, if you look at Deuteronomy 28, you'll see all the curses. Or excuse me, it starts out with all of the blessings that God says he's going to give his people if they're obedient to him. And then following that afterwards, it shows all the curses, everything that would happen to them if they disobeyed. Which, by the way, it's not God that's cursing them. It's sin that's cursing them through disobedience. God is merely saying, this is what's going to happen if you don't obey my voice. And all those things came to pass, didn't they, over time, right? Not only were they slaves in the 400-year in the period in, in, uh, in Egypt, but also during the Babylonian captivity, right? So we see God's people have some problems and issues in obedience, right? As do some of us at times. Um, okay, so, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Deuteronomy 28.15 so when you get a chance, go ahead. The lesson study is pointing us to read Deuteronomy 18. Do that when you get a chance. Go home and look at some of these and, and, and contemplate them and think about them and think, do any of these things apply today? Does God want me to, to still do a lot of these things that he's saying that he wanted them to do? Yes, yes. Even though Israel, Old Testament... Is there an Israel New Testament today? And we're not talking about the Israel in the land of Israel. That's not what we're talking about here today. So, again, who is Israel? What is Israel that we're talking about now? And what, is, what are these texts and what's this lesson talking about? Keep that in mind, okay? So, let's see... Um, Give me, give me one second here. My page turned on me. I apologize. Okay. So, the land deal. So, the land was given upon obedience that things would go well. They would be blessed. Disobedience, they would be cursed. As I mentioned, go in and look at those in Deuteronomy 28 when you get a chance. Go home and take a look at those. Um, I'm going to read from the, the, some of the text here in the lesson study. It says... Uh, these curses were largely, though not wholly, brought about by simply giving sin scope to work out its own evil results. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. So as I mentioned, these were things that would just naturally occur, not because God was cursing them and wanted to curse them, but because of the curses of sin. We reap what we sow, right? And that's what God is trying to illustrate to them in Deuteronomy here. Um, despite all the promises of the land, promises were, were not unconditional. They came as part of a covenant. Israel had to fulfill her end of the bargain. If not, the promises could, not, uh, the promises could be nullified. So in any covenant, you know, think of any covenant. We have many covenants today that we all enter into. Uh, think about when you go buy a car. If you don't pay your car payment, what happens? Deal's nullified. Your car's taken away, taken back to the bank. Same thing with the home. If you buy a home, right? 
with any covenant we enter into. So if the same thing happens with God. He says, if you don't keep your end of the deal of this covenant that I made with you, and the covenant was to obey God, right? If you don't keep your end of the deal, then the deal's over, right? I'm yes, trying to explain to people that this isn't a punishment. This is something that you bring on yourself. It's a sin that you brought on, and I'm not punishing you, but That's it's right. a result of sin. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, a great example I usually use, um, you know, first of all, God, yes, he does forgive, but it doesn't mean because he forgives that the results of your sin are not going to still be upon you. For example, mm -hmm. if I smoked for, and, and I'm not picking on smokers by any means, I'm just giving an example, the easiest one I can give. If I smoked for 30 years and I got cancer, well, now that I'm a Christian, does that mean that I'm suddenly healed from cancer? It could happen, but chances are, no, the results of your sins are still there. You know, even though God has forgiven you, sometimes we still have to pay the price for that sin, right? And so, yeah, we, if we reap to the flesh, corruption, right? So, um, the Lord made it very clear more than once. If they were disobeyed, the land would be taken from them. Was the land taken from them? Yes. Uh, more than once, right? As I mentioned, there was two times uh, that we know of. Uh, if they disobeyed, the land would be taken from them. Read Leviticus 26, 27 through 33. It's hard to imagine how the Lord could have been more explicit with his words. Uh, let me see what Leviticus 26. Let me just read it briefly. After all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury. And even if I will chastise you seven times for your sins, you shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, cast your carcasses in the lifeless forms of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. I will lay your cities waste and bring your sanctuaries to desolation, and I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. And that did happen. We know for sure that happened during the Babylonian captivity, right? But I want you to just keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, think of the spiritual end of these things. Can they happen to us now or, or future? And I'm not saying that America is going to be taken away. We're speaking of a spiritual sense. What is the land that we're looking at that's being jeopardized here if we're unfaithful to God and if we continue being disobedient and unfaithful to Him? What is the land that's going to be taken from us? The land is the New Jerusalem. Ah, yes. There is a spiritual Israel or spiritual Jerusalem Right? And we're promised that land also. That same covenant holds for us in the spiritual sense. And this is ultimately what God was showing them with that to begin with anyway. Everything in the Old Testament is actually a foretelling of the future. Okay? Does that make sense? Well, Jesus' blood washed us from sin, but it doesn't take away from what we've done in the past physically. That's right. Like me as an example, I didn't become a Seventh-day Adventist until 1980, so I didn't know about the health principles, and I, I was a drinker and a smoker and, and did drugs when I was a young man. I had no idea of the damage I was doing right, right. until I started reading Ellen White and understanding about the health principles, but still, I've had a couple strokes now, and that is a result from my not following a principle, even though I didn't know about it, still, I didn't eat right. And I, I believe that's, you know, the result of it. Whatever clot or whatever it was that uh, caused the stroke. But uh, at least the Lord has blessed me from because of my adherence to his principles and character of, of love he has healed me I'm able to walk you know, I'm, I've had two strokes
stroke now one five years in remission. The first one, I spent 10 days in the hospital. I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk. My left side was completely paralyzed. And I was able to, uh, he was able to heal me to where it only took 10 days for all that to go away. Now it's reoccurring again. You know, you know, brother, uh, years are visible, but I think that we all might have something in our lives oh, yeah. that are not good things in our lives that are actually results of things that we've done in the past, but sometimes we might not recognize that this is happening to me because of my past sins, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And sometimes we see the effect of sins through other people because of our sins, like sure. even in our children, you know? Uh, people say, why did this happen? Well, if you look back and go back, and if, but the only way we really are able to do that is if we're in Christ and we, we understand the Word well, of that's God. That's the beauty of repentance. Yes. When I turn my left, life around and, not, and I'm able, I, I was able to see the love of, of the Father and in the healing powers that he has. Yes, so yes. I, so I have a little blip in my life. I'm still able to talk and walk and communicate to, you know, my brother passed away just a, a, little, le a little less than a year ago. He had, you know, COVID, and he was a lifelong Catholic, and I was too, and, you know, before I became a seven-day Adventist. But uh, I spent a lot of time with him. Uh, I, I was able to give him a a step to Christ, and we studied it and went over it, and I gave him a, a good Bible to read, and uh, I know he's saved. Amen. I, even though, not just because of that, but he was a good Christian man, you know, and I, I grew up in, you know, a Catholic home, and, and I had good principles, but I didn't understand anything about the love of God. The fear of God that I was under, and him too, and he was totally fearful of going to hell. Because in the Catholic Church, that's right. You're going to go to purgatory, no matter what, you're going to burn in hell. Right, right. And I really, I was able to witness to him and take that fear away, and and he understood that God loved him before he passed away. Amen. You know, I mean, God gave he God gave me. A, kept me alive with my, so my brother would not burn in hell. Mm. But thanks for sharing that with us, brother. Um, we're limited. We're almost done here. So what I want to do is I just want to kind of summarize this whole lesson study, okay? So I asked the question, who is Israel? Okay, because this is what these covenant promises, they were given to Israel. We know that Israel failed, right? And as I mentioned, when Christ came, he fulfilled all those in the Old Testament, right? All those, he actually fulfilled all those covenant promises because Israel could not. And as I mentioned, when Christ came, everything went spiritual, right? So with that in mind, if I say to you, who is Israel? Who is Israel? When, the, when all these, this lesson study and the focus that it's on, who is Israel? It's really important that we understand who Israel is. on the cross and his blood washed our sins away and he, he, he died and was the father resurrected him and he's in heaven there as our mediator. Yeah, there's always been a remnant from the time of, of Genesis. Yeah. You know, you had Cain and Abel, well, the, uh, you know, the sons of God, when we read a little bit further, there's always the remnant of God. Well, the remnant of God during the time of Adam and Eve was Seth and Seth's line, okay? And so God preserves a remnant, right? And then he produces the Israelites, right? But then as I mentioned, the Israelites failed in their mission of what God had called them out to do, bringing them into the promised land, being the, the ones that were to, to proclaim the word of God to the nations, and they failed miserably. That's why Christ came. He came to show that this is how you have to do it. And interesting enough, you know what I thought was very interesting? Did God know that Israel was going to fail at all of this? Sure. 
Absolutely. So then why does he call them out? And who is the one that comes to fulfill those and doesn't fail? Because Jesus. Jesus, right? If you want to know who true Israel is, John 15, 1 tells us who true Israel is. John 15, 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. What is he saying? Well, the vine was Israel. That was God's chosen people. But because they failed and couldn't do what God needed them to do, he sends his son because he knows that his son won't fail ultimately and he'll fulfill all the promises of God for what? For his people, right? Mm -hmm. Because his people can't do it. So yes, spiritual Israel is the remnant that we have today, those that are faithful to God, but the true Israel is Jesus. And think of that name Israel. I told you earlier today, what did Israel mean? Anybody remember what the name Israel means? That's, that's one way. But the reason I'm saying it this way is because I want you to see Israel, who Israel is. Israel means, what did I say, overcomer? Or what was the other, what was the other word that I mentioned? Uh, victorious. Is Jesus an overcomer? Is he victorious? You know, you know why Jesus rose from the grave, by the way? Because sin couldn't hold him. The Bible says, so think about this. The Bible says the wages of sin is death then why did Jesus die if he had no sin? But that was why he was able to resurrect, because sin didn't have a hold on him. But the point is, is yes, Jesus is the true Israel. He is the one that we go to now, because there is, you know, today, a lot of the churches have it, have it backwards. They still are thinking, oh, the Jews. Well, the Jews were pretty much abandoned by God when he said, your house is desolate, right? But not all of them. Remember when the church, the early church started? It was mostly, it was all Jews. The early church was all Jews. But now, because of Jesus Christ, we are able to become spiritual Israel. Right? Because of Christ. Okay, so I'm going to end it on that note. Just let me just read, and it'll just line up with what I just had mentioned. I wish we had time and started earlier, and we could have got through this whole lesson, because it is an amazing study. But let me just uh, read the summary here, and we'll end it on that. God's true Israel, whether before or after the cross, is the Israel of faith. Persons who live in a spiritual covenant relationship with Him, such people function as His representatives, holding out the world, the gospel of His saving grace. So, just as we mentioned, right? Let me just have a word of prayer just briefly. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time spent. Lord, I, I wish we just had more time, Father. But I pray that each one of us today will go out and uh, study this lesson in depth, Father, and really truly understand the point of all of this that you're trying to give to us, Father, of who you are, what you're about, what our purpose is, who we are, and what our mission is, Father. Bless us today as we go out into the services, I pray, Father. Bless our leaders today. And uh, I just pray that we would all be blessed by you today and that you would uh, give us all of your blessings that we proclaim in Jesus Christ and I ask this in his precious name amen, amen. all right class yeah so like I said I just encourage you because it's a great lesson study and if you look at it in depth you'll get more of what we couldn't get out today so I hope you all will go do that what's that yeah you know it really is you know these lessons are so good because you know what always amazes me about God is when you think, you know, you get this, this great revelation one day, all this beautiful understanding that, that comes in, and you think, wow, you know, what's he going to do next, or is there anything left? And sure enough, God will bring something else in. You know, he says, search and you shall find. He'll bring some other revelation of something beautiful, a new understanding.